My name is Hank Preston, and thanks for joining me today for Dude, You Put DevOps in Your Network? Net DevOps. What exactly is Net DevOps, you may be asking? Well, let's go and peek in as Carl explains to his big his twin brother, Captain Cloud, exactly all about Net DevOps. You see, Net DevOps is the inclusion and the combination of DevOps culture, tools, and best practices to this industry of networking. Now, before we look at all of the details of what that has, we have to start out with a look at network operations in the dark ages, AKA today. That's right, we gotta look at where we're coming from before we see where we're headed. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of you should agree with me that networks that we build today are very functional, but are often considered fragile. Network configuration and design is often seen as more art than science, and the tribal knowledge of our key engineers are critical to successful network operation and changes as they go through. Have you ever heard any of these quotes? I sure have. Every time we implement a network change, something goes wrong. Or what about this one? Is it a badge of honor for you? How long your switches have been up? We see these all the time. Isn't it great? Our switch hasn't been rebooted in six years. What that tells me is you haven't done any significant security updates or software patches or maintenance on your network in six years. Would you do that to any other part of your IT platforms? And how about this one? This one's quite sad. We can't update or change our network. The business won't allow it. If your network is so critical to your applications and the running of your business that you can't actually maintain your network, well, that's not very good. How do you actually enforce stability? Now, why is this going on? What is the status? Well, the way we implement network configuration changes today, well, it's a sequential and manual process. We end up with big network changes we have to process. And so we take all of the steps, all of the infrastructure needed to be touched, and we divide it up amongst the team. Billy gets 10 switches, Jane gets 10 switches, Bob only gets three because he's a bit slow, and everybody dives in to go ahead and do the configuration. And they log into their first switch, they make the change, they log out, they log into the next switch. And they repeat for hours until they get to the end of their list. And then just as about the time the change window is over, they realize they missed some of the switches and they gotta file an emergency change window for the next night to finish up. This process results in snowflake infrastructure. Despite all three of those engineers were targeting the same actual run book and changes to go through, slight variations are undoubtedly going to pop up. And so you end up with this snowflake where every switch, every router, every firewall, load balancer, they're all slightly different. Might look great on a slide, but that's not very good for system stability. We also end up with what I call organic configuration. When we implement a site, right, we apply the best practices, our configuration standards, everything at that point in time. But over time, as those standards, those best practices, and those configurations change, we rarely have the ability to go back and maintain sites that have already been deployed or networks that have already been built. It takes a compelling event for actually for us to actually go back and make changes. And so we end up with organic configuration drift. Sites are all different based on when and who did the design and engineering. And all of this leads to something I call the culture of fear inside of networking, right? Changes rarely happen. And because they rarely happen, they have to be large and complex. We have to squeeze everything possible into those opportunities we have. And because they rarely happen, right? We're not very well practiced. And those changes are seen as a high risk. And every time we do a change, something does go wrong. They may not always be gigantic, roll back the change problems, but it doesn't matter. The change is still seen as a failure if anything goes wrong at all. And so it reinforces that changes rarely happen. Well, we need to leave the dark ages behind and move into the age of enlightenment. All right here we see Carl overlooking all of the great time and work that his software development and application developers are doing in the land of DevOps. They've got OctoKitty and all sorts of new tools and techniques that they're going after. How can we adopt this inside of the networking space? Well, DevOps starts with culture and we have to look at that. The culture inside of DevOps is about embracing change, embracing failure, and making all of our engineers accountable and empowered to make the hard decisions and the changes. Take risks, go after them. Because we know if something goes wrong, well, because of our feedback and our automation, we can react to it and implement new changes, and we continue to improve down the, as we go forward. Now, if we take this and we apply this to our culture, we need to move from a culture of fear to a culture of change. Changes need to be seen as a regular activity. 
And because they're regular, every change can be small and we become very well practiced. Change problem or problems don't occur in our changes because we can test them and verify that things are successful. The whole change was seen as a success and so we can continue to make changes, regular activities. That sounds pretty good, right? But how? How exactly are we going to move from the culture of fear to the culture of change? Well, it's got a lot of work in front of us and it breaks down to a couple of different principles. We have to look at configuration, automation, and monitoring and find improvements in all of these areas and inspiration from DevOps. We want to adopt a network as code concept around our entire network configuration. Use configuration management tools to push these configurations out rather than our typical manual process of point and click. We want to move into a continuous development approach. CICD works great for our software systems. Let's see how we can do that inside of the network. And then lastly, monitoring today is often just about forensics and reactivity. Monitoring in Net DevOps needs to be about action and real-time details. We want to be actionable about our monitoring, not forensic about our monitoring. Now, network as code is going to become a concept important to all of us. So what that really means is our network configurations have to move into source control, the same place code is stored. This gives us the ability to take advantage of features like branches and issues and pull requests to propose network changes, uh, look at what those changes actually are, know who and why they're happening, test them out inside of development branches before they ever go into production. And that source control becomes our single source of truth. No longer do we want the only place that we can be sure the way our network is supposed to be configured is the network itself. Today, you've got Visios and Excel spreadsheets and CLI templates. But frankly, the only place you can actually be sure the network is configured is by looking at the network itself. In the future, source control is going to be accurate. And if our network is deviated from source control and our single source of truth, well, we need to revert back and make sure that those changes are implemented inside of the code the way that they're supposed to be done. And our configuration management is going to use these new APIs that are being deployed and made available across all network platforms and so that we can leave CLI for our operations and troubleshooting and checking the status of our network, not actually doing network configuration pieces. And I've mentioned it a few times, but let's reiterate it. Continuous delivery pipelines for network configurations. This is where we're headed. We'll take those configurations from source control and build systems, we'll monitor, and then kick off automation routines whenever changes are proposed. We'll have entire test networks spun up on demand where those proposed changes can be applied and validated to make sure that the network is operating as expected. If something goes wrong, we report that back to the engineers, we, we propose updates to make sure those problems go away, and we repeat the process until things look good inside of that test build and then we can automatically move those and stage them for production deployments. Sounds like a lot of work, you might be thinking. So why bother? Hank, tell me, what am I going to get out of this? What are my organizations going to get out of this transition to Net DevOps? Well, you're going to get quite a bit. We're gonna move from that manual and sequential processing to parallel and automated provisioning of our infrastructure. We'll put our work in up front, design the routines, and then let the automation push this out across our entire network system-wide all at once. This will achieve the snowflake removals from our infrastructure. We'll have system-wide consistency. And while boring on the slide, it's a much better place when every one of our infrastructure components is configured the way that we want it to. And with all of this automation and tooling in place, we can truly have version-controlled infrastructure. We'll know where our proposed changes are, tracked in branches, and then as they're merged back into our master production configuration for our network, we can make sure that that's applied across the entire system, not just the networks that we happen to be working on today, but even the ones from four years ago. Sounds pretty exciting. What's it gonna to take to become a Net DevOps engineer? Well, Carl's put himself on the table and gone after it, and he started out looking like this, which is probably how you look today, and many of us have for years. We have a core set of networking skills, building on the foundations of layer two and layer three, security, application policy, and segmentation. We do have some programming capabilities, right? TCL for some basic network automation. EEM and expect scripts give us the ability to automate some of these actions. Well, as we put ourselves out there and we become the Net DevOps engineer, our skill sets will blossom. We aren't leaving behind the layer two and layer three fundamentals. Those will continue to be critical and important to our success. 
but along with those, we're going to add new networking skills. We're gonna be building networks for Linux-based applications and containerized solutions. We'll understand those networks as well as the traditional physical and virtual networks. But what excites me is about the new platform and programming skills we're going to pick up. If we're gonna be building networks for Linux and microservices in the cloud, well, we need to understand the basics of how those systems work. Now, don't worry, I'm not saying every one of us has to grow a big, bushy Unix beard, but we do need to be comfortable in the fundamentals of all of those platforms. And I'm excited. I'm a big fan of Python as an infrastructure automation and programmability language. Working with REST APIs and new standards like NetConf and RESTConf are much easier than automating CLI interactions. This is where we're headed. Now, it is a lot, and you might be feeling overwhelmed, and you're not alone. Even Carl gets a bit down now and again. And here we can see his, his brother, Captain Cloud, trying to give him a pep talk. If you're feeling overwhelmed by those, remember Captain Cloud's kind words. If you're afraid of change or you don't like change, you're gonna like irrelevance even more. That's a bit harsh. I think that there's a, a more optimistic way to look at this. Look at this as an opportunity, right? Get back into technology and be excited about everything that's going on. Learn something new and recognize that even though that may not be something that long-term makes a huge difference for you, You've now checked something out. Go move on to something else. Get excited about what technology and the network has to offer for you again. Now, if you're looking for a few suggestions on where to start, I've got a bunch for you. We've been putting together a whole set of blog posts, videos, learning labs, and all sorts of content to help drive this message and help you accelerate your journey into being a net DevOps engineer. And if you've got questions for me, please reach out. You can find me on email or Cisco Spark at hapresto at cisco.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at hfpreston, where I'm quite active about all of this good stuff that's going on. And then be sure to follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias for the latest Cisco has to offer in the programmability and API and SDK and sample code and all of those things going on. Thanks so much. I look forward to seeing you next time.